and ejection time. We tend to look at these two together because they give us a very good idea of inotropy. And in fact, from these, we can derive the true inotropy level. How does that work? Well, imagine this little child here working this pump. Every time she pulls this handle through a full stroke, she will deliver one stroke volume of water into the bucket. But it will take her a given time, the water will flow at a given velocity, and it will also be at a given pressure. But imagine now her father were to operate this pump. He would still deliver one stroke volume, but he would do it in a much shorter time, at a much higher flow rate, and at a much higher hydrostatic pressure, simply because he's more powerful. We can use exactly the same analogy with the heart. Finally, systemic vascular resistance. What this really boils down to is, is the circulation vasoconstricted or is it vasodilated? The normal is between about 800 and 1400. 1214 is plumb normal. An SVR that goes up means we have a vasoconstricted patient, a low SVR, below 800, a vasodilated patient. Very simple. OK, so you might say these numbers are all, all well and useful, but it takes so much time to get this data. Well, does it? With a little bit of practice, try this. This five-year-old girl is being measured using the suprasternal approach to the aortic valve. There you see stroke volume being measured with every single beat. She then gives a little cough, and we lose the signal. But very quickly, we get the stroke volume back beat to beat. Examination finished. So all that hemodynamic data that we just talked about, we can obtain more rapidly than you can get an EKG in most patients. Now, you won't do that the very first time you use an OSCOM. You may take two or three or four minutes. But with practice, you'll be doing this regularly in under 30 seconds. This is this child's mother. She's about to become a mother again for the third time. She has hypertensive disease of pregnancy. Well, let's measure her cardiac parameters. Well, we can see she's already borderline hyperdynamic. Oh, the examination's finished. In case you missed it, that was seven seconds to obtain all the hemodynamic data we need to treat this patient. So let's move on to some clinical cases and let's see hemodynamics in action. This is a 68-year-old male, 76 kilos, with an acute onset of severe central chest pain and dyspnea. Past history of hypertension and angina, and his ECG shows obvious ST elevation, a clear STEMI. You can see his observations here. He's hypotensive, tachycardic, tachypneic, and his JVP is elevated. He's hypoxic, despite oxygen. He's confused and agitated, a classic sign of cerebral hypoperfusion. His arterial gas analysis shows him to be hypoxic, hypocapnic, acidotic, with a significant lactic acidosis. The chest x-ray, won't surprise you, showed obvious pulmonary edema. I think we could all pick that. But just look at the shape of the heart as well. This is the classic failing globular heart. So the question is, what's killing this patient? Well, you might say cardiogenic shock. And in one sense, you'd be right. But we can do a little more than that now as budding hemodynamicists. His oxygen delivery is just 372 mils a minute. What should it be? Well, it should be over 650 mils a minute. What's really killing this man is the heart is failing to deliver enough oxygen to his body to keep him alive. 
This is the trend trace of the OSCOM, looking simultaneously at cardiac index, stroke volume, heart rate, and systemic vascular resistance. Well, what should the numbers be? Well, these are them. And if you like, these are our early goals of therapy. We need to get this cardiac index up to 2.4 liters per square meter per minute or better. We need to get this stroke volume up. We need to get the SVR down. This is four times normal. There is no heart on earth that can continue to pump against that kind of SVR and maintain normal circulation. So, what did we do? Well, we started him on dobutamine. And at 8 micrograms per kilogram per minute, his stroke volume went from a measly 20 mils to 31. Cardiac index goes up, but it's still not enough. So we increase the dobutamine, and the stroke volume goes up to 43. His cardiac index is now up to 2.3, getting close. So a little bit more dobutamine, and our cardiac output, cardiac index is now up to 2.5, where we need to be. Simultaneously, his SVR has declined to normal levels, his heart rate is coming down to normal, and his stroke volume is getting up to the right sort of ballpark. Now, you might say, well, this is what intensivists do. This is what ICUs are for. Except this wasn't done in ICU. This was done in ED. And how long did it take to achieve the kind of levels? Well, about 26, 27 minutes. So there you have cardiogenic shock, a condition which has a mortality of about 80%, no matter where in the world you are, treated entirely logically with no guesswork in ED in under 30 minutes, non-invasively. That's hemodynamics in action. So let's look at what happened to this man. Well, at two hours post-admission, we can see his numbers here. Blood pressure's improving, pulse is good, oxygen saturation's good. His cardiac index is now normal. His SVR is normal, his stroke volume is quite good. His oxygen saturation is normal. He's no longer acidotic, and his lactate has dropped to normal. But what's really changed is his oxygen delivery. We've increased his oxygen delivery by nearly two and a half times. That's what's made the difference. His pulmonary edema resolved, and he went for coronary angiography, which showed triple vessel disease not amenable to stenting. And subsequently, he underwent coronary artery bypass graft. But notice, on the seventh day, there was no urgency to graft this man's arteries. He was quite stable. He made an uneventful recovery, and he was discharged on the 21st day with no symptoms. When I saw him at follow-up six months later, he was still well with no angina. Let's look at another case. 24-year-old female, very slim, fit, and well, works out regularly in the gymnasium. Her only medication is the oral contraceptive pill. Brought in by ambulance as collapse, the patient was very confused with little history available, GCS 5 or 6. Her admission blood pressure was clearly hypotensive, but she wasn't tachycardic. She was pyrexial, she was slightly desaturating despite oxygen, and note this is a fit patient. Her respiratory rate is raised and she was sweaty. On examination, she had a right calf and foot which were visibly swollen and edematous. Now, at this stage, you might be thinking that the diagnosis is right-sided deep vein thrombosis with pulmonary embolism. But is it? Well, the chest X-ray was unremarkable. The ECG showed sinus rhythm, blood glucose was normal, and really there was nothing else that we could find except when we looked at the hemodynamics.